Hi, in this short video, I'm bringing you part two in our series on the dot product, scalar in vector projections. So there's a lot of cases, important cases, where we want to know how much of a particular vector u points in the same direction as another vector v. So for an example, Let's think back to physics or Calc 1, where we studied the concept of work. Now, in that simple case, we were just looking at, well, if you had a constant force F, and we considered F to be a scalar, you see there's no arrow, and you move it a distance D, so D again is a scalar, then you would, the work done is just F times D. Now we know force is actually a vector. And we could also consider the D as a displacement. So what if your force vector is not parallel to your displacement vector? How could you calculate the work? Well, we're really only interested in the part of the force vector, which is in this, which is parallel, not necessarily the same direction, but it's parallel to the displacement vector D. And you can see graphically that we can break down or rewrite the vector F as the sum of two vectors, the red vector, which is parallel to the displacement vector, and the blue vector, which is perpendicular to the displacement vector. So let's see how we can do that. But before we get too deep into it, well, here I've just drawn the, the same diagram a little bit larger, right? And there's certain names for these. Uh, the vector which is parallel or in, to D is called the projection of F onto D or the vector component of F in the direction of D. And then the blue vector is called the vector component of F orthogonal to D. All right, we're using this word parallel and perpendicular or orthogonal. So let's formally understand how we can tell when two vectors are parallel and when two vectors are orthogonal to each other. So two vectors are parallel provided that they are scalar multiples of each other. So to see what I mean, let's look at an example. So which of the following vectors are parallel? So I've got four vectors in space, u, v, w, and r. And I want to know which ones are parallel to each other. Well, our test is going to look at each component, the corresponding components, and look at their ratio. I'm going to check if u is parallel to v. So I'll look at the ratio of the corresponding components. I'll take the three halves over negative four, negative one fourth over 12, and one over two. And I'll see if that ratio is the same for each of the components. If that ratio is the same, I can conclude that u is a multiple of v. Well, in this case, the, those ratios are not the same. I don't need to do a lot of calculation to see that those ratios are not the same. So no, u and v are not parallel. Okay, what about u and w? So again, I take the three halves, divide it by the negative six, I take negative one quarter, divide it by one, and then I'm gonna take one and divide it by negative four. Now it's pretty easy to see that the last one is negative one fourth 
the middle one is negative one fourth. And I'd have to do a little bit of work. Remember, this would be th three halves times negative one sixth. It also equals negative one fourth. Now, bear in mind that it's not enough for just two out of three of these ratios to be equal. All three ratios have to be equal. And that's true. In fact, they equal negative one fourth. So great. That means that u is negative one fourth times w. So since u is a scalar multiple of w, or you could have said that w equals negative four times u, that would mean w is a scalar multiple of u. In either case, they're parallel to each other. So w is parallel to u, u is parallel to w. So quick quiz, can w be parallel to v? Well, v is not parallel to u, u is parallel to w. So we can conclude without doing any work that w must not be parallel to v. All right, what about u, is it parallel to r? Well, again, look at the ratio of the corresponding components. I'll have three halves over one, negative one fourth over negative three, and one over negative one half. Again, not a lot of arithmetic needed to see that these ratios are not gonna be equal to each other. In fact, you don't even have to check all three. If you find the first two are not equal to each other, there's no point in checking the third. If the first two are not equal, the answer is no. All right, so we know that U and W are parallel. U is not parallel to V, so that means W is not parallel to V. U is not parallel to R which means W is not parallel to R. The only one left to check is V parallel to R. Well, I'm going to check the negative four over one. Is that the same ratio as 12 over negative three? Yeah, that's true. Is that the same ratio as two over negative one half? And Sure enough, they all equal negative four. So V is negative four times R, scalar multiple of R. So V and R are parallel. Now we already saw in the first video on the dot product that for orthogonal or parallel vectors, oh my goodness, before I go on to that, uh, important note here. The zero vector is considered parallel to every vector because if A is any vector, if I take the scalar zero and multiply it times the vector A, I get the zero vector. So the zero vector is a scalar multiple of the A vector. So special case. Zero vector is parallel to every vector. Okay, so as I was saying, when we first studied the dot product, we learned that the dot product is uh, proportional to the cosine of the angle between the vectors. And so we already had a condition that said that two vectors are orthogonal provided that their dot product is zero. So here's a little example. Let's find two non-zero vectors, which are orthogonal to the vector V, which has components negative one, zero, and one. So by inspection, by inspection means you just kind of look at it and do some trial and error in your head. By inspection, the vector A, which has components 0, 3, 
comma zero must be orthogonal to B. You just do the dot product there. I'll get zero plus zero plus zero. Easy enough. And another vector would be the vector B with components two, zero, and two. They're both orthogonal to the vector V. All right, so back to, oh, I'm almost forgot again. Note that the zero vector is also considered orthogonal to any vector. Because if you take the zero vector, the zero, the components of the zero vector is just zero, zero, zero. You dot that with anything and you're going to get zero. So this zero vector is a real special character because the zero vector is both parallel to every vector and perpendicular to every vector. And if you recall, when we first learned about the zero vector, we said the zero vector is a vector whose initial point and terminal point are the same. Its length is zero, and we said, ah, it can have any direction you want it to have. And so, sure, you want it to be orthogonal? It's orthogonal. You want it to be parallel? Okay, fine, it's parallel to any vector. All right, so let's get back to what we were talking about. We're trying to find out how much of the vector A is pointing in the direction of a different vector B. So in order to do that, we're gonna do a little uh, triangle trigonometry. I'm going to drop in a line straight down from the head of A onto B. So, I mean, it's going to be orthogonal to B, perpendicular to B. And the angle between A and B we'll call theta. We're, for now, we're just going to call the length of that bit, which is uh, adjacent to uh, theta up to where the line ends coming down. This bit right here, its length is going to be x. All right, so since it's adjacent, in order to find it, I'd take the length of the hypotenuse, which will be the magnitude of a, multiply that times cosine of theta. So cosine of theta, we have that formula. That'll be a dot b over the length of a times the length of b. And this is going to simplify. I have the length of A divided by the length of A. So now I would get A dotted with B over the length of B. And the notation we use from the textbook is we say COMP. We put the vector A and then the vector B is a subscript. And actually this notation is nice because it uh, gives us a memory aid for the formula. We know that on top it's going to be a dot b. And so what's going to be on the bottom? Well, whatever you have as a subscript in your notation, that length of that vector is going to be in the denominator. So now we'd like to know, well, what is a vector which has that same length as the component. And it's going to be in the same direction as B. That's what we call the projection of A onto B. We also call it the vector component of A in the direction of B. So the notation we use is we put, since we call it the projection, we use PROJ, again, same idea of A onto B. So the B is a subscript. And remember that the length of that vector is what we just calculated. That's the component of A or the scalar component of A in the direction of B. All right, well, since the projection of a onto B. Oh my goodness. Here I made a mistake. A and B are vectors. So let me change 
their typeface to be the correct one. We want those to be bold. We have to be able to tell that A and B are vectors. All right, so let's just fix that up a little bit. All right, so the projection of the vector A onto the vector B is a vector which is in the same direction of B and whose length is the same as the scalar component, which we write as the component of A onto B. So our strategy is going to be, uh, well, I might as well fix all of these up. Bear with me. I'll have to fix all of these pages because it's so important. We have to be, pay very much attention to detail. It's so important to be clear if a quantity is a vector or a scalar. So I'm actually going to interrupt this video a couple times more and to make sure I always make these corrections. And I see that I have to make the correction down here as well. So let me go ahead and do that. And I don't mind interrupting the video because it is a learning opportunity, All right? We want to emphasize, and you know, this is something that you know, uh, unfortunately, takes a long while for students to learn, and they lose a lot of points for it because if something is a vector and you don't put an arrow over it, then you're going to lose points on a quiz or a test because you must be able to distinguish and show that you understand the difference between a vector and a scalar. All right, so our strategy, we're gonna find a vector in the direction of B, whose length is the same as the component of A in the direction of B. So our strategy is first to find a unit vector in the direction of B, and we learned how to do that, we just take the vector b and divide it by its magnitude. So let me go ahead and write that. All right, and then what we'll do is we're going to have to multiply that by the component. So let me go ahead and uh, quickly fix up both of these again. Oops. You know what I'll do? That gives me an idea. So. Uh, Rather than go through the typeface, what I'll do is take a shortcut and I will just put arrows above them. There we go. All right, so we're going to take this unit vector, multiply it times this scalar. Remember the component of A in the direction of B is a scalar. And now I've got a vector. So let's go ahead and simplify that, clean that up a little bit if we can. So let me go ahead and put my arrows. Our formula for the component of A in the direction of B was A dot B over the length of B. And so I'll get the length of B squared. 
um, but the length b squared, remember, is just b dot b. And that's going to be the way you should calculate it. It wouldn't make sense to calculate the length where you would have to find the sum of the squares and then take the square root and then square it, which means you would be undoing it. So really to save yourself some work, we should be thinking about this as a dot b over b dot b, all of that times b. So get my arrows. So the projection of a onto b is, I put this in parentheses because it's a scalar, a dot b over b dot b times the vector b. And again, the notation helps me remember that b has to be in the bottom. The subscript b, whatever vector is the subscript, that goes in the denominator. It goes there in the bottom. And it's in the direction of b, so it better be multiplied by the vector b. Now, we also said that uh, we can write this vector a as the sum of two vectors, one which is parallel to b and one which is perpendicular to b. And so um, this other vector, just for completeness, let's just talk about it for a minute. We call that the vector component of A orthogonal to the direction of B. Uh, and we write that with the ORTH, and we have the A with the subscript B. Uh, there's no real fancy formula for this. We know that they have to sum up to A, so we could just take uh, A and subtract off the projection of A in the direction of B. And so we could write out the formula or we could just leave it uh, as it is on the first line. So let's go back to our original uh, motivation here. We were saying, well, what if we had a force vector which was not parallel to our displacement vector? We said, well, what we would want is we'd want to um, use the part of the force vector which is in the same direction as the displacement vector. And in that case, we can still use the f times d formula. And remember, f times d, f and d were both scalars. But for now, f would be the component of the vector f in the direction of d. So that's a scalar. And the d would be the magnitude of the displacement vector. And so here again, I need to put an arrow above the D, right? Okay. So my work then would be the component of F in the direction of D times the magnitude of the d vector. So the component of f in the direction of d, so remember d goes in the bottom, so it's the length of d actually in the component formula. And then uh, I have f dotted with d in the top. Well, since I'm multiplying that then times the length of d, length of d divided by itself is 1. And so that's going to just simplify to f dotted with d. So which is a scalar? Work is a scalar. And so our formula for work is w is f dotted with d. Now, uh, in all of these formulas, we're thinking about a constant force. So my force vector here uh, is not changing uh, as we move the object through this displacement vector. 
Later on in the course, we're going to see, well, what would happen if the force field were changing as the object moved through it? Then we'll come up with a new formula. And just like we did in Calc 1, if you remember back to solving work problems, it led to an integral. And we're going to see it's going to lead to an integral, but it'll be a different kind of integral.